Uh, the 2012 draft smoking regulations has been laying dormant for three years. Dr. Yusuf Saluji from the National Council Against Smoking uh, joins us at the desk for more insight. Uh, doctor, it's been three years. Nothing's been done. Why? I think that's a very important question. And in fact, many in the public are asking, we want 100% smoke-free places. Why hasn't it happened? The draft regulations were gazetted in 2012, and they've been lay lying there. The reason for that is there's a small technical problem. The draft regulations banned smoking completely indoors. But the act itself, which is the primary legislation, allows the placing of vending machines in indoor smoking areas. So if you ban smoking completely indoors, you'll be effectively banning vending machines. And secondary legislation, regulations, can't override the act. So what the government has to do is to go back to parliament and get parliament to amend the Tobacco Products Control Act to allow it to ban smoking completely indoors and then deal with the issue of vending machines. Interesting. And, um, you know, this effect will, uh, I mean, I, I realize and appreciate that it's really for the benefit of employees. Uh, and maybe you can just elaborate on that. I mean, I know, I think, um, you know, employees aren't, yeah, sorry. I appreciate the concerns of the taverners. Yes, of course, they've got uh, s some issues to consider. But I'm afraid their position is based on misinformation provided by the tobacco industry. Every time we talk about tobacco regulations, the tobacco industry says restaurants will go bust, people won't go to, uh, won't eat out anymore. Even in 1999, they said all journalists would stop working because <laughs> uh, you smoke and you write stories and, uh, and you know, newsrooms were full of smoke. But of course, nothing of the sort has happened. Restaurants are still in business and newspapers are still being published. So it's just alarmist nonsense from the t from the tobacco industry. The reality is that the majority of South Africans support tobacco-free places, including two out of three smokers say they would want bars and restaurants to be 100% no smoking, not to allow smoking anywhere. So the majority of South Africans support the law. Between 1999, when the legislation was introduced, and now the legislation has worked very well. And the most important thing is it protects public health because unfortunately breathing other people's tobacco smoke can cause lung cancer, heart disease, lung diseases in non-smokers. What about the enforcement of this? I know, for example, in our organization, 10 meters away from a building, that's already been enforced. Uh, but is this, is this something that's been widely done? And, and who's responsible for making sure it's done? Okay, again, I think I an important question. Back in 1999 and today, the Tevinists still say the police have got more important things to do than worry about smoking. The reality is that the public, the ordinary citizen, has demanded the right to clean air and then got that, uh, got that right. So if there was smoking in buildings before in the workplace, it was ordinary people who said, I don't want to breathe other people's tobacco to smoke, went to their employers and said, please do something about it. It's ordinary citizens that are making the law work. And I think it's one of the most effective laws we've ever passed in South Africa. Because ordinary citizens support it, ordinary citizens want clean air, and they, and they then work to get it. Yeah. Personally, I'm, uh, I'm not a smoker or anything, so uh, a law like that does sound quite enticing. But uh, from a business perspective, just narrowing down on the casino industry, for example, um, you know, we saw it in Chile, and I'm sure you can name a few other examples where casinos, the smoking ban affected casinos' revenues quite materially. So they do recover because the businesses do make the necessary adjustments, but uh, that often comes at a cost to employees. Uh, so that could be followed by things like retrenchments and, and that sort of thing. You know, what then, how do you then balance the benefit between public health and, and somebody's job? I think you said it yourself. There may be short-term problems. How many times haven't I received calls from people who work in casinos and said they've been forced, they're non-smokers, they have asthma or they have lung problems, they've been forced by their employers to work in the smoking section, they then have to take time off work, be sick, lose revenue, and this happens to a lot of non-smokers. So the best thing to do is to make these places 100% no smoking, and you'll find that people do adjust. You know, I'll give you a quick example. In Ireland, there's a culture of going to pubs and drinking. And in 2004, Ireland became the first country in the world to ban smoking completely indoors. 
And everybody said, you know, drinking and Ireland go together. What's going to happen? I was in Ireland in 2005, and I went to a pub purely for scientific purposes. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I watched. I just sat and watched. And people would sit at the bar. They'd order their pint of beer. I'm not going to say a brand name. They <laughs> ordered a pint of beer and then would sip it. And then halfway through, you would see the person walk out. And they'd go outside, smoke their cigarette, come back to the bar, and continue to drink. So people adjust. The majority of people want a clean environment, as I said, including the majority of smokers. And therefore, they will support the act and it will work. Doctor, thanks so much for joining us uh, this morning and giving us uh, just an update on where we are in terms of the smoking amendment. Uh, thanks so much to Dr. Yusuf Saluji. He's from the National Council Against Smoking.